we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone for coming out today for our panel event on uh, Practice with Purpose, the Emerging Science of Teacher Expertise. Um, if for those of you who are here in Chicago, thank you for gathering. Uh, for those who are watching on Facebook live streaming, um, we're, this is the first time we're doing that, so hello to our international audience. Um, you know, the, the purpose of our discussion today is to talk about a document that we put out a few months ago at Deans for Impact, which is the organization um, that I'm the executive director of. And um, Practice with Purpose talks about these principles relating to how teachers can develop expertise. We have hard copies available for those of you who are here. Hopefully you had a chance to grab them. We were on eBay last night furiously trying to buy Chicago Cubs uh, rings for all of you. <laughs> I've heard that's a hot item in town. We had a little bit left over in the budget. Unfortunately, we weren't able to secure it for everyone, so those um, will not be available today, but perhaps in the future. Um, I'm Benjamin Riley. I'm the founder and executive director of Deans for Impact. What I'd like to do is um, briefly introduce the panel that we have today, and then we're just going to dive right in. We'll talk about practice with purpose, and then hopefully really have a conversation with everyone who's here. So we'll turn it over to Q&A pretty quickly. Um, couple of housekeeping things, just so you know, we are live tweeting this, so the hashtag is practice live, um, very exciting hashtag, so um, feel free to break out your phones and tweet away as we're talking about this. I'd also just like to thank the Joyce Foundation, um, which is co-hosting, and we're here in this building, which is um, part of their space, so we're grateful to them for helping making some of this work happen. Um, so with that, I'd love to introduce the real stars of today's show. So seating immediately to my left is Dr. Anders Ericsson. Um, he is a professor of psychology at Florida State University. He's also one of the co-authors of the Practice with Purpose document. Um, and he's really sort of the, uh, one of the most renowned experts on expertise. And so um, if you have time and the inclination, I would highly recommend picking up his book, Peak, um, which is his exploration and a very readable summary of some of what we've learned from multiple disciplines about how you can use deliberate practice to get better at something. Um, so thank you, Dr. Dr. Erickson, for being thank here you. today. Um, and to his left is Dean Ellen McIntyre from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. She's also a member of Deans for Impact. Um, prior to that, she had a variety of roles, I think at NC State, University of Louisville. Um, and she's here today, not only because she's a member of Deans for Impact, but because she's actually in the process of working with um, her faculty and her folks there to think about how to implement these principles and thinking about how to redesign teacher education for the future with a very practice focused emphasis. So we'll definitely cover that as we um, go into the conversation. Um, to her left, we have Dalara Saeed. Um, Delara is the Chief Education Officer at the Golden Apple Foundation, uh, the co-founder of The Global Teacher, which is an ed tech initiative that uses face-to-face -face technology and curated online resources. She also just has an incredible depth of experience, um, I think, in education at all levels. Uh, she was a kindergarten teacher, also a fifth and eighth grade teacher, school leader, uh, university instructor for novice teachers and principals, uh, consultant and entrepreneur. She's also the one who gave me the Chicago ring joke. So she has a, a multiple <laughs> functions here. So we're excited that she And if you see me afterwards, I can hook you up with someone who might be selling. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, and then last but certainly not least, uh, we have Dylan Kane, who is a math teacher based in Colorado. He's also one of the co-authors of uh, the Practice with Purpose document that, that you have there. Um, Dylan's story we were just remarking is, is one of the magic of social media where I happened to find his blog um, where he was talking about the application of these scientific principles to his own practice and thinking about how he could use it to improve his skills as a practicing teacher. And so he, along with Dr. Erickson and two folks who couldn't be here today, really were the, the heart of the folks who put together these principles that we're going to talk about. I should give a shout out to them too, even though they can't be here today. Uh, Christine Schutz, who's actually a professor at the University of Illinois Chicago, um, was deeply involved in this work. She would be here but for the excuse that she actually had to teach a class of future teacher candidates. So we thought that was a legitimate excuse. Um, and then Sarah Scott Frank, who um, is also a wonderful teacher educator, uh, used to be affiliated with Pitt and now consults with various folks. So, um, so we thank them and, and wish they were here. Hopefully they're watching the Facebook Live and we'll, we'll catch it later. Um, so with that, I, I thought what we'd do is actually just start by exploring the core <laughs> principles that are articulated in the Practice with Purpose document. And there are five of them, and you can see them based here with fun little graphics related to them. Um, the, the first one is pushing beyond comfort zone. 
And so, um, Anders, I thought we'd start with you maybe explaining what exactly does that mean? And when, and when you've looked at other fields beyond just teaching, what does it mean to push beyond one's comfort zone as a way of developing skill? So, so I've been sort of trying now for 30, 40 years uh, to kind of understand why some people are more successful in different domains. And, and it, I think, is striking especially like in golf and tennis, how people can actually be playing for decades without getting any better. And we're finding the same thing in a lot of occupations that people actually don't change. But in contrast, some individuals are actually able to keep improving for decades. So the question is, what is it that's different about these individuals? And what we found was that if you look closely at what they do, it's quite different. The, the people succeeding are actually designing, with, often with trainers, the kind of things that they would like to do that they're not able to do. So they're actually pushing beyond their current comfortable level of being. And, and that process of actually pushing yourself beyond that is actually the key factor that we've found related to uh, the superior performance. Can, can you give us an example of what that looks like in a particular domain, like uh, one that you've studied where you could see a practitioner is sort of struggling with a particular thing that they want to improve upon? Well, you know, may, maybe the clearest examples are uh, jogging, for example. If, if you actually on a regular, uh, you know, keep doing the same thing, you're not going to change. So basically what those individuals who want to improve the speed when they're competing, what they do is, obviously, they keep track of what's happening during the practice. And they often engage in interval training, where you actually push yourself as much as you can for maybe 100, 150 yards. And then you walk for 10, 20 seconds. And then you push yourself again. And what's interesting is that that's the kind of thing that amateur joggers hate. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's sort of the same thing with weightlifting. A lot of people like to do what they can do comfortably. But if you really want to change, you need to do something that actually stimulates the body. And I guess the way we talk about it is the practice activity is actually putting this body in a state where you activate genes that actually then leads to, in the case of, of running, uh, to the emergence of more capillaries that supplies more blood to your muscles. And eventually, as you keep pushing the limits, the heart actually remodels itself in order to be able to be more efficient. So there's a lot of things of, that's happening as a response to these training activities that can explain now why some individuals are performing better. Now, in, in other domains, just picking something that you can't do is a very frustrating thing. But essentially, the idea is if you have the right kind of training activity with immediate feedback, you can actually gradually reach now this new level and that's basically something that then can be integrated in your normal, uh, basically, uh, competitive or, or work life. Well, I think the good news for teaching is that um, with, with unruly students, you have a built-in way of activating those new capillary creation <laughs> mechanisms. So um, the next principle um, that we articulate in practice with purpose is around working towards well-defined specific goals. Um, so to that end, Dylan, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about a specific goal in your own practice that you've developed in teaching and, and how you've worked towards that and how you sort of track whether or not you're, you're on the course that you want to be on. Sure. I mean, I think um, as a teacher in the classroom, if I walk into class one day and I say, I want to get better at teaching, maybe I will, maybe I won't, maybe I'll have some insight today. I think um, one of the things I've thought a lot about this year in my teaching is, uh, as a math teacher, how do I facilitate some meaningful discussions and some discourse between students and class? Um, and that's uh, a hard thing to do. Um, but I guess uh, a few things I've thought about, one is uh, reaching out to other resources. I'm not going to figure this all out on my own, right? So there's um, a lot of great writing on discussions in math class. And one of the things they talk a lot about is um, going into a discussion knowing what the first few students are going to say. So if I give students a certain task or math problem and they work through it, they have different strategies, different ideas, different ways they make sense of it. Um, if I start the discussion by sequencing a few of those students' ideas and do it purposefully so I know this student has one strategy that uses a certain representation. This student has a different strategy. Um, and I'm uh, being really purposeful about the way I link those together and the way I uh, have students share and build off of each other's ideas. Um, 
I can launch a discussion that's gonna be more meaningful and get at some really specific goals around the misconceptions students have and what exactly is gonna move their thinking forward. Um, I think that's just one example of something I'm thinking a lot about and it's a goal that I um, could come back to over and over again in my career, right? Like I'm never gonna master that skill. And uh, I think as I keep working towards that and keep thinking about what elements am I teaching do I want to get better at, where are my weaknesses, what, what are the things that I'm falling short on, um, what are my students learning today, what are they not learning, and, and how can I kind of synergize those ideas and put them together in a way that's gonna really um, push my teaching forward in a much more meaningful way than if I just walk into class and say, oh, I'm gonna do this activity and this activity and this activity and um, you know, see what happens. And have you thought at all about how you'll track whether or not that you're improving at that? I mean, is it too early yet? Are you still trying to just get the, get the basics down and then you'll worry about the improvement? Or are you thinking about sort of having independent assessment or some way of evaluating whether or not you're able to sequence those um, beginning conversations in a way that's fruitful for classroom dialogue? Yeah, well, I think one advantage of that, just kind of zooming in on that uh, piece of pedagogy, is that it links the discussion to a really specific curricular goal. Right, I'm not just having a discussion for the sake of having a discussion or trying to teach this general uh, math discussion skill for my students. I'm saying, all right, the purpose of this task is to get students to uh, make a connection between a certain representation of exponential functions and the algebraic functions or, or whatever my goal is. Right? And so if I'm zooming in on that goal and I'm sequencing the discussion and facilitating the discussion in a way that tries to um, meet that goal, then when I assess afterwards, I'm actually more meaningfully assessing my teaching than if I just show up and teach a lesson and say, all right, I'm gonna try and teach exponential functions today. We'll see if they learn it. And at the end, maybe they, did, maybe, maybe they didn't, and I don't actually know which of my pedagogical strategies are, are more useful than, than, one, than the other. Yeah, that's great. Can, can I inter sure. interject just a minute to say that one of the things I noticed you talking about, Dylan, <coughs> is goals that relate to academic performance and goals for kids as well as goals for yourself. And, and I just want to emphasize that it's really important that the goals are good goals, that they actually lead to better teaching and better learning. And I, and I say that because I was just last week observing uh, a coach with a new teacher, and the goal they focused their whole lesson around was getting one child to sit correctly. And I, it was really frustrating for the observers because we thought, wow, well, this time could have been spent really focused on a goal around academic achievement. So. The nature of the goal is critical too, not just having a goal and knowing how to measure it, but it's gotta be a good goal. Yeah, and I, I think defining that is an open question for teacher educators and practitioners, like what are our larger goals? Yeah. How do we reach some consensus about what the meaningful goals are? You know, what goals teachers should work towards early in their training and early in their teaching? What goals they should work for yeah. l later in their teaching? And I think that's exciting work that you all are doing. Um, that I'm, I'm excited to learn more about in, in my own practice. Oh, that's great. Um, so the third principle of deliberate practice that we, um, we hone in on is around um, focusing intently on practice activities. And, and sort of what we mean by that is um, oftentimes I think we think about student teaching or sort of practice-based uh, experiences for teachers. It's sort of put them in the classroom and see what happens. And there's so much happening, and particularly for a novice, it can be overwhelming. So when we talk about focus, we're thinking about how can you isolate and, and sort of separate out and think about a particular thing um, that's happening that you'd like to, to uh, focus a teacher's attention on. And so, Delara, I'm wondering if you can talk about, in the variety of experiences you had, like where you've seen opportunities for, the, for that focus-based approach to um, learning a teaching skill. Right. And the principles, as we speak of them, I know we're speaking of them as individual principles, they're really interconnected, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. So you are pushed out of your comfort zone towards uh, a, a learning goal yourself, but you don't achieve it until you have very intentional practices in place that to build the skills to be successful, right? And so that's where goal three comes in. The idea that as adult learners of our craft, and really we are throughout our careers, adult learners of our craft, there are simulations we can have and opportunities we can have outside even of the classroom to get better at it. So I observed this great uh, lesson um, in science and often we do do this well in science content areas. 
and she had this great <laughs> lesson on using a jello mold to explain how lava and molten rock goes through a volcano and then what kinds of ways it would erupt in the different ways. And after the lesson I said, <laughs> wow, that was really cool, like I just wanted to watch you all day. How did you think of that? And she said, well, every science experiment that I will do in my classroom will first be tested on my, um, my neighbors and my <laughs> siblings and my parents and anyone I can get who will sit and watch. And you don't know how many jello molds of volcano bunt cakes I went through um, <laughs> before I got to this one. And that's exactly right, right? The idea that we would simulate, that we wouldn't just come in and voila, <laughs> it's there. Where we don't do that often well is in many other areas of teaching. And one I want to highlight is our um, new shared um, uh, you know, idea that technology will close the achievement gap and technology as a digital tool. It absolutely can be an incredibly valuable tool. But I can't tell you how many times I have observed teachers have the teacher version of a digital tool and speak to students about how to st get the tool uploaded, get it started, and they're working on it, but they've never experienced it from the student's frame. And they don't know the analytics, the, the flow, or any of the practices of using the technology. And so I've often said to teachers, for every tool you use, make sure you've used it as a student so then you can teach it better and facilitate it better as, uh, as the educator. And so does, if you're using Achieve 3000, if you're using um, eSpark, do you have a student account as a teacher? Do you practice it? And then are you able to better teach it? And that's the idea of focus and practice improving craft. I love that, and I also love that we have an EdTech entrepreneur, I believe, tacitly <laughs> endorsing the use of Jello molds <laughs> as an approach to, to teacher development. All uh, of these are great tools. Yeah, right? no, the, I mean, a, a anything, anything, yes. right? Any technology yeah. can be used if you're thinking about the goal to that, to that purpose. Um, and thank you also for, for emphasizing that these are not isolated principles, that this really is, I think, um, and, and Anders, you can confirm this, sort of a set of things that have to be connected to one another mm -hmm. in order to really get the power of deliberate practice uh, to the development of expertise. And we'll talk about some of the principles that we have yet to, I think, reach in the field of education that are sort of the next horizon um, if we really want to unlock um, what this research suggests uh, we might be able to do with. But um, the fourth principle we wanted to talk about is one that um, everyone will nod their head in, but uh, it's easy to talk about. It is harder to do in reality, which is providing high quality feedback. And um, so to that end, Ellen, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you think about that for mm -hmm. yourself within your program, providing feedback to the teacher educators you work with, how your faculty thinks about that in providing feedback to the teacher candidates they work with. Uh, sure, uh, I'll just start by, I um, Andre said it earlier that high quality feedback has to be both specific and immediate. And if and uh, Dylan said it as well, if he just if we go into saying, um, "Wow, your your discussions are getting better," it's, it's sort of generic. It's not very helpful. But if the feedback is so specific, like I notice your wait time is longer. You're waiting two to three seconds after asking a question before the before you're so soliciting a response, then the candidate can stop and think, yes, okay, now I know what I'm supposed to be doing and I can even do better. And then of course they even see differences in the students, which is really the best kind of feedback because if students are engaging more, that that's the perfect kind of feedback. The immediacy is also really important, just like in, in sports and music, if you get that immediate feedback and then right away you can correct the, the novice can correct, refine what the, what the practice is, then that's the, that, that person's on their way to improvement. And I was lucky enough to get to observe about a year ago at the Boston Teacher Residency where I saw this just beautifully implemented. Uh, a, a coach was in a classroom with a resident, a student teacher, a resident, uh, and, the, and there was, it was sort of like a co-teaching model. The resident was doing the teaching, the coach was right there observing, and in a moment, the coach would even tap on the arm, interrupt the lesson, tap, physically touch the resident, 
The resident looks up and she says, remember, it was something like, um, with practice asking high level or open-ended questions, the resident pauses for a second then starts asking the questions they had been thinking about, their, you know, the goals that they had set. And then, and then right away, the kids sit up taller, the kids started, start participating more, and this resident can see the immediate effects of this kind of really direct, uh, impactful kind of feedback, because it's, it's immediate. It was great. I, every time I've described this to, in my own institution, it's funny, my faculty will say, we get a little bit worried and say if it seems disruptive or they say I'm not sure a student teacher is really ready for that kind of feedback um, or sometimes they'll say I think that undermines the authority of the student teacher but really nothing's farther from the truth because what what happens at the Boston teacher residency is they talk about feedback they, they say this is what it's going to look like this is how you're going to feel they teach the residents how to receive feedback in a positive and respectful way. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to see, and you can see people getting better before your very own eyes. It's really exciting. That's great, and again, to the interconnected of us, you can see how when you combine sort of the um, intensifying the focus, you can find an isolated activity. Like I, one teacher education program at the University of Washington, you know, they do these sort of micro lessons where they have you know, four or five students in an elementary school they rehearse what they're going to teach to those four or five students with a teacher educator there. Um, the teacher candidate rehearses. They have a, a plan, a sort of like, here's, to, to Dylan's point earlier, here's sort of the thing I want to actually see if I can improve at. Then they do that little mini lesson. Maybe it's only 20 minutes, half an hour, and then immediately pull out and get feedback on what occurred right then and there to the immediacy point. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of thing that it's hard to do. It's hard to structure. Um, but we see strong residency programs. I'd be remiss not noting our friends from the National Center on Teacher Residencies based here in Chicago are here today. Um, when we see those strong programs, it's really inspiring. Um, so now we come to the fifth principle, which is the, I like to think of it as the most fun principle because it's the one that causes the most angst and anxiety. Um, and, and it's about developing a mental model of expertise. And I think that it's particularly um, interesting, shall we say, when thinking about it from a teaching standpoint. Because I think in some domains, um, and this we're going to throw open to everybody to talk about here, but I think in some domains, when we think about expertise, um, the mental model you have is, I, I would say, relatively simple. So take golf, okay? You need to have a mental model of what swing you are going to use and what, what will happen. And, and you're trying to make your behavior conform to that mental model of what a good golf swing looks like. But when we're talking about education, you're talking about engagement with other minds. So not only do you have to have a mental model of what sort of practices you're going to engage in, you have to have a mental model of what's happening in the minds of the students that you're teaching. You have to have a mental model on top of a mental model. You can see it gets really meta really fast. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the earlier things that Deans for Impact did as an organization was put out a different publication, also available free on the website, The Science of Learning which talks about principles of cognitive science that relate to what's happening in anybody's head, including those of you who are sitting here today or watching, as the thinking and learning process is taking place. And one of the things we've said is it's really important for teachers to have that mental model about how learning takes place in their mind as they're thinking about the activities and things that they're going to design. So, so with that meta description, I'm curious how each of you would sort of describe Men mental models as you see them as it simply relates to te teaching, um, how you can see the development of that and the refinement of that as a way of improving teacher skill over time. Anders, how about we start with you? Well, I'm going to take an example that is not based on teaching given that I'm not all that expert on teaching. Um, and, and I think if we look at chess players, uh, what I would argue that they have is that capacity of, of actually thinking through what are the moves that I want to make? And then also being able to, if I do this, what is the best counter move? And basically you can actually work yourself. And I, and I think that in most kind of situation like in team sports, you would find that the skilled individuals, they are more able once they're seeing, actually extrapolate maybe a second in the future because they can see what people are doing so they can actually see where they're going to be likely to be here in a second. So when they're making a pass, they actually in some ways have a better vision of what's going to happen. And I, I would assume that a teacher, almost like a surgeon, can actually think, okay, 
uh, this lecture. Now, one of the real difficult issues here is blah and blah and blah, and how would I be able to organize this so I don't get into kind of an unproductive discussion? So, so basically, here is sort of my plan, and then if you did a video of yourself, I guess you could actually see here afterwards and examine, you know, did I actually succeed or could I possibly have done something better here? And that's what surgeons do, the ones who can actually keep improving their outcomes over 10, 15 years are the ones who are actually recording, doing the planning, recording, and then comparing their plan to basically the execution, and then identifying things that actually require training. Because most of these skills, it's not just telling somebody, okay, you know, do it this other way. The way you can actually do it this other way and integrating that in your skill is gonna take a lot of training. And I think people realize that, whereas there still is this kind of view that if you tell somebody to change, they're going to do it. And yeah. if they don't, there's because they're just not motivated. Right. That's right. I'd also like to add, um, this is where I think mental models uh, are very exciting for me. It's the nexus of our craft. And it's mental models, and it's actually number five, uh, I'm sorry, skill number six, the principle number six that talks about experts. So we'll come to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm going to do skill number, um, principle number five and six, the idea of mental models and expert knowledge, right? And our craft can be the nexus between research, practice, and accountability, like what are the outcomes and the metrics and the results. We don't do that enough in our profession. For instance, we talked about feedback and the value of feedback. Well, uh, Dr. Kapadia, um, Kavita Matsko Kapadia in our audience right here today wrote about induction strategies for novice teachers and included in it is what research tells us about feedback. So it's not just anecdotal notes, it's not just about we know it works because I'm in the practice, but when we've looked across hundreds of novice teachers, these are the things that have surfaced, the practices that are research and evidence based, such as providing timely and effective feedback, right? But um, we don't use that enough. We say, it works because X said so, or I tried it on Y. But why are we afraid to use research to inform our practice or to even talk about it? Um, uh, uh, Pasi Selberg once said to me, because uh, I would say, like, really, Finland? And their school system, 25 years ago, like, it was nothing. Like, no offense, Pasi, but like, really, it wasn't something we were raving about. And she, he said, do you know how we got to be in the top five, Delara? And I said, no. And he goes, American University Research. Yeah. Predominant, significant amount of research utilized by the world's systems in healthcare, in education, in social policy comes from the United States. Guess who doesn't use their research? We need to do that more. We mm -hmm. need to make mental models out of what research is telling us, what we know from our individual practices, and what we're doing as collaborators. And that's how we're going to improve then very deliberate practice. I'm, I'm contractually obligated to say, for folks who may not know, Pazi Salzberg, former Minister of Education in Finland, um, I will say also provocatively, Finland did a bunch of other things. And it's unclear <laughs> what was the causal relationship, including closing a lot of education schools in Finland. But we'll leave that for a future international conversation. But he was trying to make a point yeah, about like, what we do have access to right here in the US, which is rich and abundant. Absolutely. And must be used. Absolutely. Dylan. You're someone who both thinking about deliberate practice and also cognitive science, I think has spent a fair amount of time thinking about your mental model of teaching. How do you think about that when you're thinking about the lessons you're gonna design or the activities that you're gonna prepare? Um, I guess I'll, I'll zoom in on kind of a specific uh, teacher improvement pedagogy that I've used that I, I get really excited about. And one of the ideas of mental models is it, it helps you um, kind of self-regulate and uh, compare your teaching in the classroom with what you want your teaching to be. And so one thing I've tried is teachers have smartphones, and um, most smartphones have some kind of voice recording feature. And so one thing I've tried is I turn the voice recorder on my phone on and just leave it in my pocket with the, um, the voice side facing up, and I get pretty good audio of what's happening in my classroom. And I use it a lot when I'm, I'm circulating to talk to different, uh, di different students about their work or support <coughs> small group work or independent work. And if I listen afterwards to um, 
my conversation with different students, I often have these really interesting insights that I am a lot less articulate than I, I would like to be. I think that's like most teachers experience, right? You'll say something and you're like, what, was that what I meant to say? Um, and kind of zooming in on those examples, I um, am able to kind of compare my actual practice with what I would like my practice to be. Uh, listening after the fact, I can zoom in on, all right, so I have this student who um, is really anxious in math class, and I, it, I just know that her experience in my class is kind of being scared and feeling like she's had all these negative experiences with math and that she can't be successful. And I zoom in on, on that interaction and say, well, like, are, are these things that I'm saying actually effective? Right? I find myself referring to different topics as easy or hard. And I say, well, like, when I s say that topic is easy, I'm actually kind of telling that student that she's dumb because she can't figure it out. Right? And um, I'm able to compare what I would like my teaching to be with what I'm actually saying in the moment. And I find that to be both a pretty easy and um, you know, low barrier to entry of pedagogy and one that has really helped me have some insights about my teaching and about how I'm impacting my students. That's interesting. Your mental model actually is like an audio mental model. It's like trying to come back and check sort of what you thought was happening versus like how it actually sounds upon reviewing. Yeah, That's and, really interesting. And, and they're different more often than I would like to, yeah, yeah. I would like to think. I would, sure. You know, I think it's important in teacher preparation that it's the, it's the teacher educators who also have to have mental models about excellence as a teacher educator. Just like as a dean, I have to have a mental model for, for deaning and, and what the kind of dean I want to be. And, um, and I, I would be terrified, I think, if I tape recorded my own meetings and you know, think about what I might hear. But, but I don't think that teacher educators think like that. I mean, even the really good ones will be thinking about how to help develop, help their teacher candidates develop mental models of the kind of teacher they want to be in the K-12 world, but maybe don't even think of themselves as as needing that kind of mental model of, of, of doing any kind of rehearsal um, approximations of their own work. And so we, we have to keep going all the way back. This is a very layered process. We all have to be doing that kind of deliberate practice in order to get better at what we do at all, each of these levels, I think. Ellen, I have to ask, what is your mental model of deaning <laughs> when you, no, but in, in all seriousness, when you run into a faculty sort of that you were hinting at before, who yeah. says, well, because this, I think, happens a lot. There isn't a shared paradigm, if you will, around what effective teaching necessarily looks like. And so if you run into a faculty teacher educator who says, well, I don't want to interfere with teacher autonomy, what's your mental model that you use in order to sort of open up a conversation there? Wow, this is like being put on the spot, because I, have I haven't even, th I'm only just starting. <laughs> I like to, to do that. As <laughs> I know. I'm only just starting to really think about all of that, and I just think, um, one of the things I, I always go back to is the children in the classrooms that, that these teachers will serve that our, that my faculty will then produce. So I just, I always think about those kids <coughs> and the kids and, and what we want them to learn and how many children out there, out there aren't learning to their potential because of their teachers who came from a teacher preparation program, mine. And so I think about that and it, it, it can be the, the way that I begin. Um, I know that I have uh, the kind of personality and leadership style that does push a little, and I'm glad about that. But where I always have to be really careful because it's a delicate balance. You, I, and my, my mental model, the kind of dean I want to be, is one that always pushes, but with respect, support, and even love. And if I can, if I can manage that, I will get people with me, I think. Uh, it's, it's a progress. It's, it's in development. So. Uh, but that is yeah. my model. I'm curious, so, so um, you know, Delari already hinted at it, and I would love to get everyone's perspective on this. So we have these five principles, but there are two principles of deliberate practice that we talk about in Practice with Purpose as sort of the, the unfulfilled components at this point. And one of them is sort of a, agreement upon who are the master mentor teachers. In other fields, I think it's fair to say, we know who the best violinists are. We know who the best chess players are. There's really no arguing about that. Do we know who the best teachers are? And, and if we don't have like a, you know, we're not gonna have league tables, of course, or at least I hope we don't have those, but if we don't have a shared understanding of that, do we at least have some insight into how to identify them, you know, in our own experiences and when we've had those? I'd, I'd mm. love to get feedback on that. Right. So I talked earlier also about that nexus, and we talked about um, the nexus between research and practice, and the third leg was 
metrics of success, outcomes, yep. and accountability, right? And that has to be part of the conversation um, because these principles are not just about practicing them, they're towards an outcome desired of student learning and student growth. And I think that's what we look at when we look at who are master teachers. Now I work for the Golden Apple Foundation and our model is all about using current practicing master teachers to then develop the next generation of teachers. It's kind of an apprenticeship model. Mm -hmm. It has worked for many other sectors, but we don't employ it as much in education. In education, 93% of our day is in isolation in our classroom. So collaboration time is not there. How do we make sure teachers get good at that so they can be the expert? In the 1980s, late 1980s, the typical teacher in America had about 13 or 14 years of experience at that moment. Today, the typical teacher in the United States of America has one year of experience. So looking for those experts is really, really important, right? So how do we do it? Yes, you should look at engagement in the classroom, right? You and I sometimes call that the spark in the eye. Um, a student goes home and looks, at, uh, looks on Google because you talked about something in the classroom and they wanted to extend their learning. That's one metric. I don't think we look at that enough. Number two, student growth data. Right? So the question isn't growth or mastery. The answer is both growth and mastery. And I hope our Secretary of Education p pushes oh, back here we go. growth <laughs> and mastery. We have an opportunity here to get some fresh eyes on our field, but also we got to push the envelope so we get to where we need to. So growth and mastery, let's look at both of those as metrics. And then let's look at content knowledge and the expertise our master teachers come from. So I, I see these as four or five different metrics of a master teacher who's then ready to teach the next generation. So yes, expertise is not just because someone is um, a, a great teacher because a, uh, a parent said, right. my, my student loves that teacher. That's one metric, because that's that first metric of engagement and relationship building. But let's be very didactic and look at student learning, student growth, and look at mastery of your own content and skill sets. Yeah. Uh, Anders, I wonder if you have any <coughs> suggestions or insights, maybe again coming from other fields, about how we begin a, to go about developing even like a research agenda around this. Um, because I feel like, you know, in the case of surgery, I'm not sure what's used to identify the world's top surgeons. Uh, any thoughts about sort of, you know, how to begin thinking about the the way about identifying these these master mentors? <laughs> right. Well, I, I'm actually working with the American College of Surgeons, uh, and, and we're identifying uh, surgeons who have better outcome data for their patients. And I guess when it comes to cancer surgery, uh, it's pretty clear cut here. You know, if you have a remission, it means that the surgery probably didn't remove all the relevant cancer tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, and there you actually right. do see very clear individual differences yeah. and also growth curves. And, and I think basically what we're interested in now in identifying the top ones to hopefully help them inform uh, the ones with less successful outcomes, you know, how they can modify their procedures and, and maybe even their kind of training activities. Now, one thing that I find interesting and, and somewhat challenging with New, uh, with education, con in contrast to this domains that we've looked at, is that when you start playing the violin, you have a clear trajectory. Mm -hmm. And you basically, in some ways, have a sense here when you're making progress, you're working individually with the teacher yeah. who's actually invested in, in identifying the kinds of things that you need to change, so you have a trajectory. And, and then also you can play for an audience and demonstrate to other people here that you have mastery. If we take like mathematics, uh, you know, there is some implicit progression, but it's not really clear what the end state is. I mean, what is it that if we were to assess the mathematics outcomes of high school seniors, what is it that we would say here is a very successful outcome? And, and I think the other thing is, you know, basically having some way of individualizing training. I, I was talking to uh, a, a world-class coach for uh, 
in volleyball, and, and when they're training with a team, the problem is how do you actually kind of find a way here of, of providing now time and, and, and basically the possibility here of individualized training. And, and when I was up there, we kind of started experimenting with, you know, giving maybe it's only like 15 minutes where actually the coach is now working individually with somebody, trying to point out now exactly what is it that they could possibly change and then proposing what they can do on their own to basically improve that and then coming back maybe next week with another 15 minute session. But it, essentially that idea that you want to train individuals to become independent learners. And, and I think that's another thing that I feel our school system is not really providing uh, help with. You know, where you actually have a sense here of <laughs> what does it take to be really good at something? And then basically how do you actually you know, sense when you can actually make the most progress learning-wise. I think a lot of school children, even college students, they don't really have a sense here of that you need to be rested if you're actually going to be able to, you know, productively do something hard that you can't do. So basically there's a lot of these more general principles that I think could easily be integrated into the current school system where you actually give people a sense here of what do you need to do once you're committed to being good at something. And that could be very different things. It could be some individual sport, or it could be music. It could be whatever. I, I think it's I think it's <coughs> easier though to to sort of map out a, a trajectory around mathematics, or say even reading reading and inst reading instruction. We we know a lot from research mm -hmm. about about how kids learn how to read, for example, and what they and, the, and it's a, there's a very specific sequence of skills that they build one upon another in order to, for them to become really good readers. But what we don't know is the teaching trajectory that maps onto that. We don't really know what teachers need to learn first, then next, then next. I mean, there's becoming a body of research around. This is, it's gonna be a great research focus, I think, for the next decade in, in preparing teachers as well as just studying teaching is that trajectory. What do teachers need to learn first, next, in order to support that trajectory? We've got it in violin. I mean, the, viol the violin teacher knows that, right? The chess teacher knows that, maybe. I don't know. Pro probably the, the surgery teacher knows that. But yeah. teaching can... It's well, I, I'd like to ask Dylan, you know, as, as a practicing... How long have you been teaching? Five years. Five years. So you, you probably have enough vantage point now to think about what are the things, perhaps, that you really wish you'd had under your belt when you started? Um, or, you know, are, are you able to sort of think about sort of looking back, to, you know, what you would have liked to know then that you know now to think about sort of the skill development as a teacher? Yeah, I guess I, I take maybe a bit of a different perspective because I think both for me and for some really great teachers I know, their teacher preparation um, instilled in them what I would call a mental model of really great teaching, right? So it, it um, didn't just set them up to focus on kind of lower level skills when they started. And it didn't leave them to say like, oh, like you are gonna define the kind of teacher you wanna be and you know, you can pick what you wanna work on and what you wanna get better at. It was like great, and in this case mathematics teaching, great mathematics teaching involves giving kids high cognitive demand tasks and giving them the support they need to do well in them, right? And that type of vision of what great teaching looks like is both really inspiring when you're in a teacher preparation program and also it sustains you during your practice as you keep pushing yourself to move to a higher level. And so I think in my teacher preparation, the um, kind of interactions and mentors I'm most grateful to are the ones who gave me a really clear vision of what I want my teaching to look like. Um, I think in terms of the specific skills that I want in the classroom, I think there's a huge tension, unanswered question about what, um, what the, the balance is between classroom management strategies and pedagogy. And I think that's a tough question because it depends where you go. The, the school where I went, my biggest challenge my first year was classroom management. Um, and that was really hard for me and that drained me. And I had some skills and I had enough skills to um, feel like I could be successful by the end of that year and to keep me you know, inspired to keep teaching. It didn't chase me out of the classroom. Um, but I, I think there's a huge variance there. And I think that's a question about connection between teacher preparation and the specific schools that teachers are going to. And, and also a question about you know, how, how you balance those goals in a way that keeps teachers focused on the right stuff while 
going into a classroom able to keep their head above water. So, so uh, recently I've been sort of watching videos of different teachers, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that came up when we were kind of talking about different teachers is what is it that the student leaves the classroom with? And, and basically, so if you have three lectures on the topic, how often do you actually do an individual assessment and then compare your assessment about what students actually were successful in grasping whatever it is? And I got the sense here that a lot of the teachers, they were more focused in on basically providing an abstract scheme. But if basically, if you were to ask students, what actually was, <coughs> what can you remember from this lecture? My sense was that maybe not very much. So the question is, you need that feedback loop. But it seems to me that there's a reluctance, of, at least on some teachers' part, of actually seeing testing as an integrated part. I mean, if, if you basically in the violin said, OK, I'm just going to be teaching you stuff here, you know, and then you can go home and practice by yourself, uh, I mean, it's almost like it's so important that you actually have that generation and activity that you can actually observe and give immediate feedback on. And it doesn't seem that a lot of the lectures that I saw tapes of really had that element <clears throat> Occasionally, they would ask a question, and then maybe four or five of the students would raise their hands, and, and then basically you would get an answer, and there would be a little discussion. But how did that touch the rest of the people? And, and my sense is that it's the students who are actually doing the learning. So if you don't actually control what's going on in their heads, nothing is going to happen. Uh, except maybe that they're going to be bored and, and start now doing really non-productive things. Well, so let's, um, and I want to turn it over for questions from the audience in just a moment here. And we'll have, I think, a mic circulating about for that. But, but let's go into a controversial area here. And, and I'll put you on the spot, Delara, because you kind of cracked the door earlier, which is I think that if we take the principles of deliberate practice seriously, we have to think about like almost continuous assessment mm -hmm. of students and student learning. And, and we use that word, but we ought, that often also includes tests. Mm -hmm. And using tests to be able to evaluate independently from a, a, an individual judgment of a teacher, independently whether or not learning's taking place. We also know, I don't think I'm breaking any grounds here, that that's radioactive in some quarters because of the entanglement of testing with accountability regimes and policy. So, Dalar, how do we fix that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you in a minute. <laughs> um, you know, the key here is uh, the, what the Dylan said earlier about he himself is grappling with, and with the tensions that can help him be better at his craft, right? And the vast majority of teachers, three million plus in the United States of America, want to get better at their craft. They want to be held accountable yes. for doing the work that they are being asked to do. They want to have partners in this work with community organizations, with families from their school, and with their administrators. Having said that, the challenge that we find with um, testing, some testing, right? Everyone uh, does quizzes, tests, some type of formative assessments. We build them for our own units. We craft them for each day's lesson. And we look at them and get better. When we talk about some high stakes testing, the challenge becomes one, the lag between the test and the feedback. And we just talked about you can't improve instruction unless feedback. You said immediate, Ellen. I'll just say timely yeah. enough yeah. to make some change in your craft. Yeah. But when you get a test result three or four months and the next year has begun, very challenging to understand how we could do that kind of improvement. And then when that test then becomes the sole indicator sent out to uh, the district, the community, the country about how the school, the, c the district, or the teacher is doing, then that then we've negated all the other pieces I talked about, which was engagement, growth, all of the other pieces, right? So one, testing alone cannot be so high stakes um, that it negates all the other metrics of success or challenges we could see in a classroom. And number two, testing has to have feedback opportunities for the teacher so they can improve their craft. It's not a gotcha because 
they didn't do something or they did do something. It's not an award or a gotcha. When those things happen, we can absolutely do it. And, and they're happening. There are school districts throughout the country. We have 15,000 school districts, give or take a few. There are many by far that are looking at a more robust and a comprehensive way of accountability versus a one track way. So what No Child Left Behind and the testing era did is at least put accountability as a discussion on the table. It did, and we needed it. And now we can take that pendulum and swing it back to the middle where there's a comprehensive set of opportunities. Yeah, I think one of the things at Deans for Impact, you know, we spend a lot of time going out to visit uh, the teacher preparation programs. Ellen mentioned going to visit uh, the Boston Teacher Residency. And it gets really excited when we see um, teacher educators and the teachers in the classroom and the teacher candidates all coming together to look at what's happening with the <laughs> students that they're teaching and to, to use the sort of assessment of learning as the foundation for thinking about whether or not what's, what they're trying is working and how to improve at what they're doing. And I think that that um, is one thing that uh, as an organization, the for Impact is very much hoping we can foster mm -hmm. throughout a lot of the programs that are preparing future teachers. Um, I want to turn it over now to our audience, which has been um, graciously waiting with thousands of questions, I'm sure. Don't be shy. Um, we'd love to hear from you questions you have for anyone in particular or generally about um, deliberate practice and these principles and how they can be used for teacher education. Hi, I'm Hi. Kathleen from Northwestern University. Um, and I think all this work is fabulous and I'm totally bought into it. But I know um, already from some conversations I've had within my own program <coughs> that there are some culture shifts that have to happen in order to implement some of these ideas. And so I'm wondering if you have any um, anecdotal experience that you can share with doing that just broadly speaking. Yes. Um, we, we've been um, lucky, a, li a little bit lucky. Um, we have, um, we're in the middle of a, of a big pilot project. And right now, it's so far, it's been invitational. Um, so we have 30 of our, we have 120 faculty members in, in my college, about 60 are teacher prep. So about half of them, which is really significant, uh, are eager to be part of the pilot project. So because th I think um, ownership has to come from within and come from peers more than from up top, I made this invitation to participate in our redesign. Um, it's becoming clear to the faculty members, the supervisors, and the cooperating teachers, we call clinical educators, that those are the mentor teachers in the schools, we're coming together around common language, around accomplished teaching, and we're all getting um, professional development on coaching, it's becoming clear just through conversation, and this is how culture shift happens, right, through conversation, it's co becoming clear that this is where the innovation is, this is where the exciting work is. I, I, in part, I think I just got lucky because those 30 faculty members, I'd say 20 of them are our also our top researchers in the college. So we have people with a lot of um, influence in the college who are participating in this. So I, ju I just feel part of it is luck and part of it is um, doing this gently but also with a lot of enthusiasm. It helped that we got some foundation money to start. But this transformation that we're making, we have a very large teacher prep program, this transformation is going to happen over the next three years. I think people are figuring out that this is the this is the way of the future, and most people want to be on board when it comes to thinking about the future. I'm going to have some holdouts. I know that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be just very few. So converta conversation and invitation is my two strategies so far. Can they be expected to spend as much time 
time and energy reflecting on their practice and getting better? And then if not, how, how do you shift, you know, a teacher's course load and the expectations mm -hmm. on how much work they're bringing home so that the profession is sustainable? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a hard question. I think in, in my experience, teachers are excited to get better. Like that's just a thing that almost all teachers are on board for. One of the aspects of these principles that I think can be empowering is this idea of focusing on specific goals. That well, what we're saying is not that you should be um, working to get better every minute of every single day. It's that there are some goals that are worth working towards and every teacher has things they can improve. And so at a certain time, have one thing that you wanna get better at. And that focus intently piece means quality over quantity. Right? It doesn't mean I'm doing this every day or e even every week but it means I'm finding some places to zoom in on that practice um, and think critically about it and, and invite some feedback or have a conversation with colleagues. Right? And, and so I think that part of the message is really important. One of the results from Anders' research is that this is often unpleasant in the sense that it's, like it's hard to do deliberate practice day in, day out. Right? And so I think it's asking appropriate things of teachers. Um, one message I've heard from a math educator, uh, Steve Linewand, is he tells teachers, you know, it's unprofessional to ask teachers to change more than 10% a year. That's just un un unrealistic and not, not appropriate to ask a teacher. But it's also unprofessional not, not to try to change at least 10% a year. And that's really compelling for teachers. And I think that type of message, that we want to get better, we want to focus that practice on the right stuff and the right amount of time, um, is going to buy a lot of people in. Not everyone, but enough to, I think, make a difference. Your question um, almost uh, is asking, uh, are we on this on our own, right? And, and, and there's a lot of, uh, of, of angst there in teachers because there's this incredible amount that we are responsible for for our, for our students, and then there's this incredible amount we're responsible for for our careers, right? And I'm gonna answer it in two ways. One is what you do individually, and two is what you do through leadership. Um, individually, uh, you know, we need to also share with teachers that teaching is a career-long craft. We often want teachers to go in their first year of teaching and then become masters at their craft. I, that is not the expectation. There's reasons for that, even whether you like it or not, things like tenure, things like other things. It takes time to get better at your craft, and we have to allow teachers to, to do that. Like, Take your time. That first year, it's just keep your head <coughs> above water. That second year is, ah, second time through the curriculum. Do you understand a little bit more yourself about what U.S. history is? And you're learning it as you're teaching it. You know, I, I used to say I love teaching U.S. history to eighth graders because I just like learning U.S. history. <laughs> like with, uh, and so like every year I was just learning it. And then, you know, I was like storytelling and then telling them what I'd learn. And we were together learners in the classroom, right? So there's, it's a trajectory. So we need to be patient and merciful with ourselves as teachers and understand that growth takes time and that we're on that trajectory. Even with the urgency of this group of 25 to 30 students are ones I have got to do well with this year, it's still, but if I have wellness and patience and do this craft creating well, I could be doing for 15 years. If I push myself too hard, I will leave in three. The second piece is the administrators. You know, we talk about teacher preparation and that's really great. Administrator preparation is just as important. We have got to have training and development for our administrators so that they understand this, that they see growth in teachers yearly as the um, outcome or the goal, not complete mastery every year in teachers. Um, how do we help administrators be instructional experts and instructional supervisors? In Illinois, we say 51% of, uh, of an administrator's time has to be as an instructional supervisor. Are we training them to do that in our schools where they are getting degrees in um, uh, administration? So it, it doesn't happen alone, it happens in a community. And then the culture shift. Deans are culture shifting um, in their deaning work. <laughs> and schools are culture shifting in, in their work. Going back to deans, I mean, we have Rob Muller from NLU here. And I know, Rob, you came on a couple of years ago, and you're talking about culture shift when you and I spoke two years ago. And, that work is hard, and how do you do some of it? 18 months. 
It <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you for that question. I, just to add a little bit more perspective, I mean, one of the things that I've found um, amusingly frustrating is is the work we do at Deans for Impact is primarily focused on the development of teacher candidates and transforming that experience. People say, well, yeah, but even if you succeed at that, they're just going to go in the schools, and what are you going to do about shifting the culture there? And it's like, geez, can we, can we work on one problem at a time here and one, one effort at a time? But I will say, I have this perhaps naive optimism that if we get this first part right, and if we start to inculcate this almost scientific mentality in the approach to teaching that questions like, hey, I need more planning time, is something that, will, that, that teachers as they go in and they're choosing where they are or if they have as they develop sort of the ability to shape the culture, that they'll start to be the agents of change within the schools. So don't take the culture, and I, I know this, again, I, I call it a naive optimism because I know how hard that is, but don't take the culture for schools for granted and think that it's immutable. You know, if we can change teacher preparation, I think we can change school environments to create those opportunities so that there should be more planning time. America is weirdly obsessed with instructional time. It is a unique country in sort of saying, if you're not doing that all the time, then you're wasting time. And in fact, if we could get a lot more bang in the buck, I suspect, if we allowed for some stepping back, more planning time, more collaboration. Speaking of Rob. <laughs> <laughs> The Lars question, maybe the next panel can be about, about culture change. I would make kind of one observation, though, to, to um, you know, Ellen's point, you know, this idea of an informed conversation or facilitation with an attitude um, is really, really important to bringing along, um, you know, a group of people who are at very different, different <coughs> places. I mean, one thing that has struck me in, in, in my role at NLU is we are a distributed institution with five campuses and a lot of folks online. Our students are mostly working adults. So what you might see from my position across the entire institution, you don't see if you're a reading specialist on the Elgin campus. So how you, you kind of deal with this, what, do you, what you see depends on where you sit question, I think is really important in driving mm -hmm. culture change. The other piece of it, though, is, is measurement, right? Um, Conversations are great, but without explicit measurable goals, preferably quarter over quarter, um, it's hard to know whether you're making progress. And that's been one of the challenges you know, for us in this enterprise is how do you take these big ideas and break them down into measurable bite-sized chunks that people can, you know, can really um, you know, get on board with. Um, you mentioned instructional time, so, uh, and first of all, and thank you for a, you know, a great panel and a, a really useful um, report. It actually ties in a ton with a lot of the work that we're doing in driving change in our teacher prep program. So time, experience versus, I, you know, I love the fact that in the first line or the first paragraph, you note that we conflate experience and expertise. It's instructional time, right? It's seat time in student teaching. We'll just do more of it and somehow we'll do it you know, we'll do it better. Um, when you think about expertise and acquisition of expertise, it's a different beast. And I imagine, I'm kind of putting this question to each of you because I think your perspectives are going to be different. When you think about expertise as opposed to experience, you know, what pops out? And how do we do that with the constraints we have of, you know, being time limited, resource limited, all that kind of thing? That's a great point in this report. Thoughts on expertise? Well, maybe we should have somebody with a more teaching perspective. Uh, I, I personally uh, obviously link, really avoid the term expertise because I think it links people's expectations here to kind of a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, mm -hmm. when in fact uh, in our work we try to find now objective performance. So if you're winning chess tournaments, you know, then there's basically no doubt here how good <coughs> basically you are, but it really needs to be that type of more objective evaluation. So if you're relying on supervisor rate ratings, we find you know, that there's often a mismatch here between uh, those ratings and, and, and the actual more objective performance. And, and if you can clarify what it is that you want to achieve, then there should be a possibility here, not necessarily using the available tests, but designing an assessment procedure that people would actually be happy with. But if you're really saying there's no assessment that can be done, then it seems to me that you're actually saying here, we can't evaluate progress. And, and, and that is something that I guess I would argue against. 
I'm, I'm a little stunned, Anders, because you're saying you don't like to use the word expertise, and you literally wrote the Cambridge Handbook of Expertise. <laughs> so and <laughs> expert performance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so important, important. So, so basically, uh, if you see my chapters, I, I try to avoid expertise. Uh, expert performance. And, ex and, and use the term expert performance, because I think that is objective, yep. whereas the expertise thing yeah. has been used in a very different way. So Like that. When I think about Rob's question, I, I think about um, teacher preparation programs and how much time uh, a prep program will expect students to be in the field um, practicing. Mm -hmm. And again, I have to come back and say quality over quantity. Just the number of hours in there really doesn't make a difference. And we know that. We know that from research. But, but the quality, I mean, we all have had somebody in our lives who said one or two things that made all the difference for us, right? Well, it's, that's about expertise, or that's about, about quality of feedback. That's the quality of a mentor or a model. And so if we can find those, those um, experts and put those experts in front of our, our candidates, uh, less time is probably better than more time. I think there's also, sorry, Nilar, just the, there's emerging research, too, suggesting that um, not just time, but thinking about the relationship of student teaching to the eventual place where a teacher goes and teaches. So yeah. some of Dan Goldhaber's research, it's sort of like, have you actually been prepared for this sort of environment that you're going into, or is there a big mismatch, and lo and behold, if there is, then you actually are not ready to sort of navigate that environment. Laura, you're nodding, is hey, it that? Thanks sentence? for the segue. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for setting up my answer. Um, I see experience as breath. Right, like so you've done a lot of this work, you've done it in a lot of different ways in any um, field, whether it's uh, teaching, uh, so it was the breadth of your work is your experience. The depth of your work is your expertise. And you can't build expertise in everything, so you build expertise in certain areas. For the Golden Apple, our expertise for our young novice teachers who will go on to be master teachers, we hope, is in schools of need. All 600 that are in our pipeline right now at colleges of ed across Illinois are going to be college students who will graduate and they will go into a school of need, 30% or higher free and reduced lunch and uh, schools where they're not meeting AYP at the rates that they should be. That's where we want their expertise would to be. So when you say, you know, the expertise could be where they're going, yes, we want, to un we want them to understand the students they will have at those schools, the relationships they will have to build, the trauma training they may need to have before they go into those schools, and then the content strength that they will need to have. So um, we will have lots of experiences in our lives, um, but we will have few areas of expertise, and that's where we've chosen to go deep. In our case, it may be where you're teaching. It may also be the content area you're teaching. You might be the school or the district's uh, person for uh, physics, and that's your expertise, and you're really great at content, and you're, you're, you're working and you're grappling with your pedagogy and your teaching, but you're really great at your content, that's your expertise, but it's a small sliver of your work. Impossible to be expert at everything. That's right. Other questions? Got one back here, and then we'll come, we'll come back to the front. I wanted to go back to um, two words that you mentioned, respect and support. And I think about the teacher that's in it for the long haul, that teacher that we want to have stay. And when I was a principal, um, what tenured evaluation looked like was that you were put in a study group with your colleagues. So you picked an area where you were going to push beyond. There were people at different levels of mastery. You had a plan. I sat in on all of those, observed you, but you had constant coaching and a focus over years to build that expertise. Mm -hmm. And what I saw was rapid change within my school because I could have six teachers working on the same idea in literacy. And also I saw that notion of respect for where you are really become natural. I, I think that's a key element that we have to come back to as a nation respect for the professional, and giving them opportunities to grow. Mm. I think I speak for all our panels. Today. We all want to work at your school and yes. know more about <laughs> how we can clone you to have you create those cultures in other places. Karen Garaba, a military, um, was the former chief of um, language and culture at Chicago Public Schools. So great expert in the field. 
There was questions down here. Uh, I was, I know what the statistic you mentioned about the fact that the average level of experience is one year, and I'm curious to ask you all why you think that's happening, but I really want to ask, you know, I spent a lot of time in kind of debates around education reform, and some of them are pretty vitriolic, and I feel like principle number one, push beyond your comfort zone. I feel like if you stood up in front of a bunch of teachers in a struggling school and said, okay, first thing, we want you all to push beyond your comfort zone, <laughs> I think they'd throw you out of the room. So how do, you, how do you get past that? How do we motivate the vast majority, not the excellent teacher, not the top 10 or 20% who are <laughs> self-motivated, but the, the huge body of teachers out there who feel they're working very hard uh, and who apparently are leaving the profession in huge numbers, how do we motivate them to do this really hard work? Mm -hmm. Um, I open it to everybody. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to start? Go ahead. Okay. John Cotter of the Harvard Business School talks about the eight steps of change. And step one is simply appreciating and validating where we are. So if you have teachers in a really challenging situation and they don't have a lot of experience, um, validating where they are and then as you're moving towards change, really appreciating those small wins. And that small win might be a relationship with a student that is challenging in their classroom. That small win might be one great lesson in a classroom where it's really difficult to, to teach because of the management and the behavioral issues. And so I think when we say push beyond your comfort zone, it's all relative. The comfort zone is very different depending on the settings and the work that we're doing. And I think good administrators need to understand that. Uh, as far as keeping teachers in the classroom, um, I think there's a really important handoff between a teacher prep program and uh, that first year of teaching. And I think the residency programs probably do it best, that, that whole handoff. And one of the things that they do is, prepare, as, as, as Ben was saying earlier, prepare teachers for the schools they will be teaching in. And unfortunately, I think across the nation, typical teacher preparation programs haven't really thought about it like that. It's not that people are doing bad work. We just haven't really thought that we're just, we're, we're teaching teachers for any place they might go. Um, and I think we have to rethink that and really try to uh, prepare people for particular situations because there are particular challenges. I think also that university-based teacher prep programs have to own those first three years. We, we really do have to say, if those folks aren't successful in years one, two, and three, that's on us. Beca beyond that, we know the sort of the school culture and the leadership of the school sort of takes over. But if they're, if they're dropping out in those first few years, we have that you have to look back at the prep programs because we should be preparing them and supporting them. So there are a lot of induction programs going on right now. Some of you are in the field of induction. Um, that's really promising. We have to make those that handoff really a smooth transition. Yeah, I, I just want to emphasize that point that if you think about policy and its focus over, say, the last decade, we've really changed the bargain for what teachers get. And we change in a way that I'm not sure what they got as like the trade-off. So it's like we're going to hold you individually accountable uh, in ways that we haven't before. Are we raising your salary? No. Are we doing other things that are sort of a trade-off for that increased responsibility? Like it hasn't been obvious, I think. And so, so to, to Ellen's point a moment ago, there has to be shared responsibility here. And teacher education programs need to take on and shoulder more of that responsibility. So it's not the case that we're now going in to frustrated, bedraggled teachers who've been teaching in some of the toughest schools who for damn sure don't want to hear us talk about how we need to intense, you know, make it more intense, right? It's intense enough. <laughs> but like if we do the work on the front end, as Ellen's describing, I mean, one of the principles that animates everybody who's a member of Deans for Impact is to focus on the outcomes. Focus on what's happening once those candidates that you have prepared are in those schools. You have an ongoing responsibility to them. It does not stop at the moment of graduation. So I feel, as you can tell, quite passionate about trying to spread that responsibility in ways that I think for too long has been very bifurcated in the field. So <coughs> if we were to apply the expert performance approach to that, I, the questions that I would ask, are there successful teachers in these schools? 
Uh, and to what extent can we actually study them to actually now mm -hmm. uh, design a training that would allow people, before they get to that, this place, to really be prepared and in some ways have met the standard? I mean, it would be the same thing as taking high school players and just putting them in the NFL. I mean, you know, they're going to be crushed. But, but it's sort of everyone realizes that their skill level, and you should be able to assess that even before they are actually getting into these schools. Uh, and, and if it ends up that there's no teacher in this school who can actually manage, then obviously it's a system problem that needs a different solution. Uh, but I think basically that idea here that it should be possible to assess teachers' performance even before they take on the first job. I mean, it's a little bit similar but most people would like surgeons to have exhibited some degree of competency before they actually take on their first patient. Yes. And, and it would seem to me that something similar should be applied here to teachers. Yeah. Although I will say it's harrowing after reading some of your research and book that like I will now ask how many years have you been practicing and sort of and how have you been thinking about that if I ever have major surgery, which I hope I, that doesn't occur. Hold on, let's get the mic just we're recording this about your practice and you are mm -hmm. only five years in so I'm curious what have you participated in or what's put you on this very thoughtful route as a teacher so early in the game it's uh, <coughs> a hard question um, I think it was great mentors who uh, really inspired me to think about what great teaching was and how complex it was I think it was mentors who pushed me to um, take a really critical lens for my teaching, to always ask, me, did my students learn anything today? And to be able to say, the answer is probably no for many of the days of my first year of teaching, um, if I'm being really honest with myself, and to um, kind of confront myself with the true challenges of teaching and of making a, a difference for students. Um, I, I am, I guess, part of a community of math educators who um, write blogs and attend a lot, of, a lot of conferences and are involved in a lot of different types of professional development, uh, a lot of writing, a lot of um, kind of collaborative work, thinking about curriculum, thinking about what great curriculum looks like, trying to write great open source curriculum. And I think that community has um, pushed me in my teaching and also um, been this um, kind of groundwork of opportunities to do this practice, to think critically about teaching and um, engage in that type of thinking. I also think that um, I have gotten better at talking about teaching at a faster rate than I have gotten better at teaching. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> probably unfortunate, mm. um, but it's easier to get better at talking about teaching than it is to get better at teaching. Mm. Can I ask you a quick follow-up? I did almost all of the education program there, um, and then went to a teacher residency that um, mm. that engaged in a lot of these ideas. And so I, I both had a, a prolonged preparation. I spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. Um, and I, I got a, a few different perspectives that I think created a really rich experience for me un unintentionally. And I think I have criticisms of both of those. Um, but I think they synergized and happened to synergize well for me and for where I ended up and for what, what the trajectory I've gone on. And just so Dylan's been cautious to mention it, but I'm not afraid. I'll out him. <laughs> he attended for his residency. Um, it was the Spasado Graduate School, which is connected to a charter school in Boston. Has a very um, practice-based focus, but I think also has um, a, an aspiration to, to this intellectual side of the practice as well. And there really is a vanguard of movement, which unfortunately I think in the field is sometimes viewed as threatening of these new programs that are being you know, preparing teachers for um, all these different environments, and, and there's resistance to that. And it's unfortunate because some of the more interesting practices of the lines of which are, are helping folks like Dylan, and, and now that you've had the chance to engage, you can see, like, this is what we want. This is what we want to have, our practitioners who care about the profession with this level of detail and are going to be lifelong learners as educators. So it's one of the things we've tried to do at Deans for Impact is build a bridge between those communities. We have folks who are coming from the quote unquote traditional teacher education field and traditional quote unquote colleges of education, 
but we also have folks who are coming from programs like the one Dylan was part of. Hi, uh, I have a question uh, for Dr. Erickson. I'm very interested in uh, learning trajectory. You used the case uh, students learn how to play violin. You mentioned that uh, the teacher would identify the things the student needs to change. So um, in education, in teacher education, uh, we also try to um, help our teachers think about the student learning trajectory, especially in math. So based on your research on other fields, can you say uh, more about the key elements of a learning trajectory of learners and how the knowledgeable others um, in other fields identify you know, the learning trajectories of learners? I think it could be very powerful for teacher education, especially our teachers really need to understand the student learning trajectory. For example, even when they teach mathematics, they need to understand that, and then with that, to design tasks, you know, design the pedagogy, you know, design activity. Thank you. I, I think this is a really interesting question. I've been actually struggling to see sort of a clearly uh, specified development of math where there is some endpoints, uh, either it's preparation for basically university study and the sciences or whatever, but essentially kind of clarify what the end point is. Whereas the domains that we've been primarily looking at have very clear, clearly defined endpoints. And, and I think uh, the other issue is having a teacher that you're working with, maybe if you're a music teacher, it would be five to maybe even 10 years before you're switching over to a more advanced teacher. So, so thinking about kind of these systems, so obviously, and, and, and it's m not realistic here to think about it, but if we actually had unlimited resources, how would we basically design an educational system that would actually be excellent both for the teachers and the students? And then basically start thinking about that and then once you see the differences, maybe there are interesting ways in which you could incorporate certain elements, like, for example, providing time here, like 20% uh, of the school day is, is sort of dedicated to a student being able to select something that they're going to be good at, and where the school is providing now external teachers that would actually be able to help that student sort of reach a measurable performance in, in some domain. So, you know, I realize that these are kind of very vague ideas, but I think it's useful to start asking the question. So once we know what the ideal situation is, maybe we will be able to see here, you know, points at which one would be able to sort of kind of get closer at least, uh, and, and, and thereby, you know, helping students to get consistent feedback so they can actually build fundamental skills. Because I think that's one thing that we're finding now when I'm involved here in K through 12, that it's not just the teacher who's teaching now. Basically, when they're getting to calculus, that's gonna be a key here. What is it that the fundamentals that they're learning now in fifth grade that they actually have when they get to basically that point? So even if you're a great teacher and whatever it is that you taught are going to be lost here in sixth and seventh grade, then obviously there's a mismatch and and having some way here of basically building a system where you're actually connecting the different pieces and, and thereby giving feedback to those teachers who are able to do basically understanding job of providing these fundamentals as opposed to perhaps finding ways of allowing them to solve the problems w and, and avoiding maybe the hard work here of, of actually getting them to think in a way that would be more fundamentally part of basically the way they're thinking in mathematics. A, a different perspective on that is some of the best PD I've been involved in has been, um, especially with the potential of the Common Core that we all have the same, or many states have the same standards, um, unpacking the progressions of the Common Core. So thinking about what are the things that kids should learn in sixth grade that build into things in seventh grade and eighth grade, and what are the essential ideas that we're gonna build off of in the future, and where do those go in high school, and I think you know, spending time both thinking about those progressions and then looking at student work samples from different grades and thinking about how their thinking has moved forward and mm -hmm. what teacher actions are gonna lead to 
exactly that, that type of thinking. I think that's been really valuable for me and it is a form of practice, right? That's like focusing intently on this one element of my instruction that happens outside of a classroom, that happens in a very safe environment and a collaborative environment that I think can be really, really powerful. You have to forgive Dylan. He's been teaching in the classrooms. So he doesn't know the current Secretary of Education has declared the Common Core is no more. I, so I, I read that we'll pick yesterday. that up again in uh, a, a, a well, different and, dialogue. And, and Colorado is rewriting their standards, and they're like, oh, yeah, just change them so we don't call it Common Core anymore. That's right. Yeah, the Colorado State yeah. standards. Yeah. Ben, I was wondering uh, with Ellen, um, you know, you talked earlier uh, offline when we were before the presentation about your close relationship with the school district mm -hmm. and how schools of ed can leverage their relationships with the school district to do exactly this, like then study this work and get it back to us. Say more. Relationships between school districts and teacher prep programs are essential. You, I mean, that's, that's actually where you have to begin. Yeah. And, and, not, and not just for understanding curriculum and um, learning trajectories and teaching trajectories and all that sort of thing, but it's for everything, for, for just getting in, in the door. And, and also, of course, be, being able to do research um, um, together in, in a collaborative way. So um, I, I can't emphasize that enough. I, that, um, that takes a lot of a dean's time and my associate dean's uh, time, our professor's time, but it's always time well spent, especially if we're gonna move in this direction of preparing teachers for particular kinds of environments. Mm -hmm. It means our work is, is really much harder because we, we have to go into a lot of, we, we prepare teachers for rural districts as well as for the urban schools in Charlotte and Mecklenburg. And, um, and so it just takes time. But if you have those partnerships and good relationships, um, then you get a lot of help doing it. So. Yeah, I was going to say that the, the question that came earlier around, uh, you know, the trajectory, I think that that um, is where eventually we'd love to see the field be. I think the intermediate step is what was sort of emerging, I think, in the last few comments, which is having just alignment between the district and the teacher education program around the goals, around what it is that you want to see your teachers able to do. Unpack the content of the content standards that you're going to be teaching in that state. So it may not be that you think about where do you start and where do you finish right away. We'd like to get there. But just start with a common language and a common focus that allows you to have a conversation. And we've seen programs that our members lead who have that relationship, and it's not all of them, but when they do have that relationship, it's really powerful. Hi there. I'm Kavitha Kapadia masco I'm at National Lewis University. And as Rob said, we're in the process of re-engineering our teacher preparation programs towards a practice-based model. And as we've been thinking about the steps that we need to take with the faculty, right, to, to engage them in this conversation, we've also been thinking a lot about the role of the mentor teacher, the cooperating teacher, and how that needs to shift. And I know that emerged a little bit earlier. And um, we've certainly been thinking about the, the fact that, or anticipating at least, that we're going to need to do a lot more intentional supporting of the cooperating teacher, right, so that they can be in a position to give the kinds of immediate mm -hmm. feedback. Um, that they need to give, but I, as I'm thinking about this more, it also seems that we may need to help our cooperating teachers um, engage in some unlearning around the, the typical supervision role, right? Cooperating teacher as well as university supervisor, because we think about it's no longer about helping our teacher candidates develop a unit and implement a unit, right? Instead, now we have to create spaces in our classrooms so that multiple rehearsals can take, back, or can take place and the way that we engage with feedback around that. I mean, it just looks different. And so, um, Ellen, as someone, as I know, you're in the process of this, I would just love to hear um, some of the reactions of the cooperating teachers that you've been working with, um, you know, and what you've found needs to, the kinds of conversations that you need to have in order for this new learning to emerge. Okay, well, first of all, Kavita, I did not see you back there, so hello, uh, mm -hmm. good to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's interesting because we're, this summer we're having a four-day institute, a summer institute for, for four days, all, all day long, for our mentor teachers, we call them clinical educators, faculty, and supervisors. So it's a, only a group of 100 people, um, which is fairly small for my institution. It's um, about a third of, of the, of the candidates we'll produce next year. Um, and w one of the things we're gonna do is reinvent 
the position of the university supervisor mm -hmm. and the clinical educator, and I hope push the faculty as well. So we're trying to reinvent positions. I too thought, think that, say, that the university supervisor job is really outdated. I've said to people, I think we spend hundreds, I know we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every year on that role. And these are all good people, they're talented, smart people, but they're not really moving or improving the teachers, those candidates, in a way we think that is you know, possible. Um, and the same thing with the clinical educators. These are nice people who care and who, um, and, and who wanna do good work, but it's just as you described, Kavita, it's, um, it's an old-fashioned model that hasn't necessarily provided opportunities for practice and feedback. And what do these candidates need? Deliberate practice with feedback. Immediate, ex explicit, positive, uh, specific feedback. Uh, and that's what our model's about. So, we're, we're, so what have I heard from the mentor teachers? Uh, it's interesting because in order to plan for this institute, we had to interview them. We brought them in, we brought group, many, many groups, and we actually had some Deans for Impact facilitators there listening, so it wasn't just always me and my faculty. We had outsiders come in and interview school district people to say, what are your goals, what do you want, and ask them questions about how, what would this be like for you if you were more of a coach rather than a supervisor. So we got feedback from them. It's too early for me to answer your question directly about what effect it's had because um, in a year, ask me that question. We're, we're just embarking on it. And I would say too, Im embedding mm -hmm. inside schools helps so much. You know, sort of, it, it's a relationship business. So if you're going to do some unlearning with a cooperating teacher, they're only gonna do that if there's trust that's been built. And how do you build that trust? Being on site, understanding the context of the communities. When we've seen within programs that our member deans lead where they've created those relationships and literally have their, their, their faculty educators embedded inside programs, teaching courses inside you know, an elementary school, that changes the nature of the relationship. So that's, that's a strategy that I would like to see more teacher preparation programs pursue where they can. We are just about out of time. So unless anyone has a burning question, um, I wanna thank our panel for an incredibly rich discussion with an incredibly mm -hmm varied set of experiences. I really want to thank everybody who came and what a wonderful set of questions and what a wonderful set of you know, folks who are here who obviously are passionate about this work for one reason or the other and are doing this work, it sounds like, in one way or another. And I'm just so grateful for that. So when we do this next time, hopefully we'll have some sort of Chicago Cubs paraphernalia for you. <laughs> um, and I just want to thank you for being here today. And um, thanks to our folks listening in.